Well, thank you all so much for making the time to, uh, to come out today. Can you hear me in the back? Is the audio okay? And for those of you joining online, really appreciate that as well. My talk today is called Wildlife Health in a Rapidly Changing World. And I think, I hope by the end of it that you'll, you'll understand why I often tell students that we need nature and nature needs us. And that's really the theme of the Wildlife Health Cornell Center of Excellence. So everything I'm gonna to talk to you about today relates in one way or another to the relationships between wildlife health, domestic animal health, and human health and livelihoods, all as underpinned by environmental stewardship. And I wanna start off just getting everybody on the same page. They're obviously, from lunch I could tell we've got a diversity of backgrounds. I wanna take a little bit of a global perspective uh, and I just want to talk a little bit about our species' ecological footprint before I fall off the stage, speaking of footprints. So we use about half of the planet's ecosystem production for our own purposes right now, and we've converted about half of the ice-free, desert-free surface of the planet to crops and pasture for our own uses. We currently use about half of the planet's accessible fresh water. We have contributed to the loss of about half of the planet's tropical and temperate forests, more than three quarters, actually probably 85% plus of the world's fisheries are now overfished, and we have dammed the majority of the world's freshwater systems with huge impacts on migratory fishes. And if we weren't here, if we weren't here, species extinctions would be a thousand times lower than they are. So in a sense, we have met the enemy and, and he is us, but we can solve these problems, but we need to know where to start. And when I talk to students, you know, those statistics I just gave you, I'm sure many of you are aware of them, they can be oppressive and overwhelming and even numbing. Um, but it's also easy to sort of put them aside. And there was a recent study that really gave me renewed enthusiasm for what I do uh, in that uh, the World Wildlife Fund and the Zoological Society of London look at all the vertebrates in the land, on the land and in the seas, and basically figured out that the number of animals uh, since I was born, I'm, I was born in the early 1960s, so I'm not that old, but the number of animals on Earth today is 60% lower than when I was a kid. That's not species, that's just biomass, that's number of creatures, vertebrate creatures on the land and in the sea. So to put it in the framework of a human lifetime helps, because sometimes I think we, we, we recognize the snapshot, but we lose track of the movie. This is, there's urgency to what I'm, I'm describing to you here today. And it's, it's not a mystery why we're in this predicament. It's a math problem, okay? There's two factors here, and I'm sure most of you are aware that we are, in the next several decades, on the way to having about 11 billion people on Earth. So we have a growing human population, and our consumption patterns are, are problematic in that if everybody lived a lifestyle like we do here, we would probably need at least three Earths to sustain that, and obviously we only have one. So we've got this combination of growth in human populations and shifting consumption patterns, which is causing those shifts in natural resources and in the systems that we, we need that I described to you. So I admit that those are, those are dire, dire statistics, but we are making progress reversing many of them, and I wanna talk to you about some of the things we're doing under the Wildlife Health Cornell umbrella. Uh, centered at the veterinary school, we, my program uh, basically does four things, and I'm gonna run through what they are, and then I'm gonna give you real-world examples. So the first thing we do right now is we respond to the health threats facing uh, key species, species that are really representative of the major ecosystems around the world, and I'm gonna give you some examples. A lot of what I do personally is provide guidance to governments on land use planning, and ways to make wildlife and livestock more compatible often through a socioeconomic lens. So it's really looking at scale at how countries can do a better job sustainably managing their resources. We work very basically to minimize disease transfer between wildlife, livestock, and people. Those of you who are aware of many of the zoonotic diseases from SARS to avian influenza to Ebola, these are things that we work on. And all of those things basically roll up into that last category, which is building new constituencies for conservation. Uh, when I was younger, and I tell this to the students, I thought conservation could be successful through arguments based on ethics and moral suasion and aesthetics. Unfortunately, that's not often the case, and much of my job now is about working with sectors that need to see that conservation is in their strategic interest. So I work a lot with ministries of public health and other governments, with, with departments of agriculture, on ways for them to see that environmental stewardship is actually something that's in their benefit as well. 
So I want to start with the first one that I flagged, the species entry point. An entry point for me is a doorway. So I'm going to give you several doorways that we try and open to facilitate conservation. And the first example I want to talk about is our work on tigers. So in the early 1900s, there were probably about 100,000 tigers in the wild on Earth. And that's the tan color on this range map. If we flash, fast forward to today, there are just under 4,000 tigers left in the wild in the world. So that's about a 96% decline. And this map, uh, the brown, is where tigers are, although this map is a few years out of date, so the range has contracted a bit. So we've got poaching pressure, loss of habitat, and as populations of animals get fragmented and reduced in number, they become much more susceptible to disease. And in fact, disease can be what tips the last domino towards extinction. And uh, about 15, 16 years ago, um, we started to see something very strange in tigers in the Russian Far East. You've probably all heard of Siberian or Amur tigers. Of that 4,000 tigers that are left on Earth, about 10% of them are in the Russian Far East. So there's just about 400 tigers left. And about 15, 16 years ago, we started to see tigers wandering out of the forest. They seemed almost like they were blind. We described they were, their behavior was neurological. They were sort of pacing around, wandering into traffic. You can actually see some of these videos on YouTube, and no one knew what was going on. So we dispatched uh, uh, some of our scientists, and what it turned out to be was the first cases of canine distemper in wild tigers ever. All of you who have dogs in, undoubtedly vaccinate your dogs for canine distemper. Uh, we, were, we were very concerned about this because the tiger is already under pressure from habitat loss. They compete with people for their prey, some of the deer species out there, uh, and they are poached. So we were worried that distemper could actually be the last, the last straw for them. And one of my team members, also part of the Wildlife Health Cornell team now, is Dr. Martin Gilbert, and he's one of my conservation heroes. He was so interested in solving this problem is that, so he decided to go do his PhD in Russia on this specific challenge. And what we were hoping Martin was gonna find was something really easy to manage. We thought, going into this, that okay, probably the people who have dogs out in the villages around Russia aren't vaccinating them, so they're getting distemper and they're spreading it to tigers. Figure that out, we can vaccinate all the dogs, problem solved. Unfortunately, six years later, what Martin figured out was a totally different situation, and he's now an epidemiologist and a modeler, and what he figured out was that the fur farming industry is probably what brought this virus that doesn't belong in the Russian Far East out there. There are a number of mustelids, uh, you know, mink, sable that are farmed, and they have a form of distemper, and they often escape. And what it looks like happened is that the virus escaped into the wild, got into a whole range of other mesocarnivores, small and medium-sized carnivores like badgers and raccoon dogs, and now it's permeated the entire ecosystem, and tigers get it when they consume some of these other animals. So there was no easy fix. In fact, the only way to mitigate the threat to tigers is to vaccinate tigers, which is actually quite difficult. They're very, first of all, they don't want to be vaccinated. <laughs> if you've ever brought your cat to the vet, you know what I'm talking about. But they're, they're very dispersed. They're, they're all over a very large area. And so we are doing some work, and we're, we're trying to increase our resource base so we can test some of the currently available vaccines, which we're doing in some zoo tigers, but we think we're gonna need to develop something that doesn't exist right now, which is an oral vaccine for this disease. Now, those of you who know the rabies problem in the, in the northeastern US, we actually have baits that we drop from airplanes, fish-flavored baits that raccoons and skunks eat to vaccinate them for rabies. The reason that's possible is rabies is a disease of public health concern, so there's actually money for that type of R&D. Distemper is right now not a disease of public health concern, and so it's hard to, to find the resources, but that's where this is headed, and this is all being done and explored in partnership with Russian colleagues. At the same time, Martin is managing one of our portfolio uh, pro priorities, which is the Wild Carnivore Health Program. And I, I need to tell you why we're working on carnivores. So I'm gonna talk to you about various things that we're doing under the Wildlife Health Cornell umbrella. And Martin's work is all focused on carnivores because they are really, just like the tiger, the proverbial canary in the coal mine. If we can save a top carnivore, that means we're saving the entire ecosystem. Because to save a carnivore, you have to save their prey base, all the wild animals that are in healthy populations that they need to eat. Uh, they are very susceptible to the, what we call edge effects, when people move into areas with their livestock, so they're barometers of, of the integrity of habitat, and we know they need large home ranges. So again, by focusing on carnivores, we're really putting a magnifying glass on really important areas worldwide for biodiversity, for conservation. The other reason that we're focusing on carnivores is just like the tiger example, they are susceptible to what we call multi-host pathogens, diseases that move among different species, like rabies. 
like distemper. I want to just talk to you a little bit about lions. We talked about tigers. Uh, this map is from National Geographic. In the early 1800s, historical data tell us that there were about 1.2 million lions. You can see every country in Africa on through the Middle East and into Central A into countries like India. If we go to today, today the bright yellow is what's left. We are down to 20,000 lions. So this is a more dramatic decline than I described for tigers. The reasons are similar. It's competition with human populations. It's conflict between lions and livestock. It is loss of habitat, but it's now also disease. Again, these multi-host pathogens like distemper and, and, and bovine tuberculosis, which is another disease that doesn't even belong in Africa. The Europeans brought it in when they, when they were colonizing the region. So there's another reason to work on, on lions. They are, again, that charismatic vertebrate that is, they are an umbrella species for saving what's left of wild Africa. I couldn't not talk about African wild dogs. They're one of my favorite animals. They are the most endangered carnivore in Africa. There are just under 5,000 of these animals left in the wild in Africa. Uh, and how many of you have been on safari in, in southern or east Africa? Okay, quite a few of you. If you've watched lions and wild dogs, and this is a little bit of a distraction, but I just have to tell you. This is from the Okavango. When I was the first wildlife veterinarian for the governor of Botswana, I spent a lot of time with wild dogs. If you watch lions kill, when they kill, the big male gets to eat first, then the, the adult females, and if there's anything left, the cubs get to eat. But if you watch wild dogs, it's the opposite. When they kill something, all the adults back off, and the pups get to come in and eat first and then the adults get to come in. And that's just really neat evolutionary divergence between these two top carnivores. But I digress, because I like them. Snow leopards are another one of those umbrella species, those flagship species in Central Asia, in the high mountains of Asia. And Dr. Gilbert is just back from Tajikistan, where we're working with the government, looking at the health of the prey base, looking at the wild sheep in these mountains. And one of the threats is that there are a lot of diseases of domestic animals, sheep and goats in particular, that if they get into the wild ungulates indirectly, they will eventually impact the top predators. So again, by focusing on the health of the ecosystem, we can secure a future for the entire assemblage of animals, focusing on the snow leopard really as, as a vehicle to, in many ways, focus the government's attention. As I talked about the wild dog being the most endangered carnivore left in Africa, this is the most endangered carnivore left in Asia. This is an Amur leopard, again in the Russian Far East. There are only about 50 of these animals left in the wild. They're in one park in the Russian Far East. And unfortunately, about a year and a half ago, we had our first case of canine distemper in one of these folks. And so our vaccine work is very, very urgent, and, and it would certainly be applicable. These are actually animals that are, are more amenable to vaccination. They're not as widely dispersed. How many of you knew that Cornell is also home to some of the world, well, probably the world's top expert on rhino health? How many of you have rhinos that occasionally get tummy aches? Anybody? Okay. We are. This is a project in Ujong Kulong, Indonesia. This is a Javan rhino. This is the most endangered rhino on the planet. There are only about 55 of these guys left on the, in the world in one place. Unfortunately, they live in the shadow of the volcano Krakatoa. So they're at risk. They're also at risk because there's an increasing population of uh, domestic water buffalo in the villages around where these rhinos live, and some of the diseases that impact the buffalo, we are concerned, could impact the rhinos. And I want to introduce you to another one of Cornell's conservation heroes. Again, everyone I'm talking to you about is part of the Wildlife Health Cornell Center of Excellence. Robin, who's actually one of my former students, is also known among friends as the rhino whisperer. Um, he's worked with virtually all five species, and this is uh, Rosa. She is a Sumatran rhino, not a Javan rhino. There are only about 100 Sumatran rhinos left in Indonesia and Malaysia. They are highly endangered, largely because of deforestation. We'll talk more about deforestation. But their habitat is being uh, uh, hammered largely by agro-industry. Rosa wandered out of a forest fragment and needed to be rescued. Uh, and one of the things that happens when we have to bring these animals even temporarily into captivity, they have all kinds of weird biomedical issues as well as nutritional issues that we need to make sure are dealt with. And Robin, he's the guy. Uh, and the other thing I'll say, having worked with rhinos myself, they are incredibly personable animals. When you bring rhinos, whether African or Asian, into a captive setting, very quickly they generally tame down, and they're like puppy dogs. They like their ears rubbed, their eyebrows. Some of them like right here in their inner thigh. They are really individual animals, and I think people don't recognize that. So again, a range map. This is the range of the black rhino in Africa. The yellow, again, early 1900s, about 100,000 black rhinos across Africa. The little red areas are what's left today. 
we're hovering at about 5,000. You're seeing the trend here. We are seeing these dramatic declines, but we're not at numbers that are not irreversible. And as a matter of fact, when I was at the World Wildlife Fund, the black rhino hit a low of about 2,300. So we've almost doubled since uh, the early 2000s because of some of the good work that many of us have been doing. So Dr. Radcliffe and Dr. Robin Gleed, who's the chief of anesthesiology at the veterinary school, um, have been asked to help a number of African governments with an interesting challenge. Rhinos are largely uh, under threat from poaching. Many of you know that rhino horn is in demand, particularly in places like China and Vietnam. Rhino horn is the same protein as your fingernail, okay? It does, the rhino horn does grow back, um, but it, it is in such high demand that rhinos are being shot virtually every day. And so African governments sometimes need to catch the animals and move them into safer areas that they can more easily protect. How many of you, and you don't have to answer this, this is a, 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 if you've ever been anesthetized, hopefully your anesthesiologist said to you, well, you know, we're gonna do this procedure, but there's some risk that such and such could go wrong. Well, it's the same with wildlife, except with our patients, we can't say, you know, don't eat or drink 24 hours before your procedure. So we have to go out there and dart them, and maybe they're near a waterway when they might have a risk of drowning or they might have just had a big meal. Anesthetizing big animals is risky, but we need to do it to move them to safety. And so, in some countries, they do it in order to cut off their horns, which doesn't hurt. It's like clipping your fingernails. But by dehorning rhinos, it sometimes discourages poachers when they see them from a distance. So the problem in Namibia was that some of the rhinos were in such remote areas that the normal way of moving them anesthetizing them and moving them on trucks, it took too long. They were too remote, there weren't roads. And so the Namibians needed to make sure there was a safer way to anesthetize them and make sure they were safe. And how you, just like with a big horse, the position that a rhino is in, whether on its chest or on its side, that affect its, affects its cardiopulmonary function under anesthesia. So you need to know what's going on. And it turns out this is the safest way to move a rhino long distance. I kid you not, and when Robin started this research, I, I did not think this was gonna be the case. Those animals are anesthetized. They are completely asleep. They are hung upside down from a very powerful helicopter. They can move this animal in about 20 minutes where it would have taken hours and hours on a truck. And the question was, is it safe to hang them upside down? And with sophisticated cardiopulmonary monitoring, Dr. Radcliffe and Dr. Gleed and Wildlife Health Cornell are literally saving an animal hanging by a thread. I want to talk to you about some of my own work, which is uh, a different entry point. So I've talked about big cats and wild canids. I've talked about rhinos. Now I'm gonna to talk to you about large landscapes, big pieces of conservation real estate. And to do that, I need to take you to Southern Africa. This is an image I saw quite frequently when I was Botswana's first wildlife veterinarian in the early 1990s. This is a zebra dead along a foot and mouth disease control fence. And I gotta tell you a little bit of history to put this project into context. I need to take you back to the late 1950s when all the countries I'm gonna talk about were colonies or protectorates. So Botswana was the British protectorate of Bekawana land. Namibia was German Southwest Africa. Zimbabwe was British Southern Rhodesia. And this is before diamonds were discovered in this part of the world. These were poor semi-arid areas. And the colonialists, the Brits and the Germans primarily, were looking for ways to get economic traction. If you're a colonialist, that's what you do. And I'm gonna compress history a bit in the interest of time, but what they seized upon in the late 50s was the idea of getting beef from Southern Africa back to the motherland, back to Europe. But they knew, even in the late 1950s, that there was a virus, the foot and mouth disease virus, that lived uh, naturally in the African buffalo. And it turns out the African buffalo is the only species in the world that naturally harbors this virus. And they don't really get sick from it, they just carry it. How many of you remember, for example, when foot and mouth disease got into the UK and farmers were committing suicide, and it cost the, U the, the UK government billions of dollars. This is a disease primarily of trade impact. If you get foot and mouth in your country, you can't export any animal products from, from cattle, sheep, goats, etc. So the world greatly fears this disease. So in order to get the beef out, what they decided to do was to build fences to keep the wildlife over here and the livestock over here. And this happened since the late 50s over the ensuing decades thousands of miles of fences have been built. Now what I can tell you happened over those decades is what I describe as a slow motion environmental train wreck. Wildlife was not considered a valuable resource. This was a monosectoral decision based purely in the interest of beef. And hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of wild animals have died along these fences because they need to migrate seasonally. These wild animals need to move every year to access fresh water and grazing at different times of year. And when you put up all of these fences, they perish. 
These fences were funded largely externally by the World Bank, by our own government at, at one point, by USAID, by the Europeans. And so we have this legacy of really an environmental disaster exacerbated by a focus on one sector, which was beef. That's the bad news. I promise there's good news in this talk. Let's talk about what the good news is. So that was going back to the late 50s. And I need to take you to today, OK? Today, the entire economic picture in this part of the world has changed. Today, wildlife, and we were talking a little bit about this at lunch, is, is worth more. It makes bigger contribution to the gross domestic product of southern Africa than agriculture, forestry, and fisheries combined. So the whole macroeconomic picture has changed, and that has not been lost upon the heads of state of these countries. Those blue blotches on that map are what are called peace parks, or trans-frontier conservation areas. That's what the TFCA means. And I need to tell you what a peace park is, because what the heads of state of these countries have started doing going back about 16, 17 years, is they are trying to recreate those wildlife migrations, recreate those corridors, and putting more land under wildlife. They're making wildlife a priority because it's economically important. When students ask me, what have, what have I been doing for my whole career? I tell them I try and do two things. I try and make wildlife economically rational and socioculturally acceptable as a land use choice. If I can do those two things, conservation wins. So now that wildlife has value, they're trying to create these peace parks. And a peace park, by definition, is when two or more countries agree to reconnect land across an international boundary and make it wildlife friendly. So maybe uh, there's a national park in Botswana that gets reconnected to a game reserve in Zimbabwe, for example. Those animals need that connectivity. They need to be able to have genetic exchange to be viable for, you know, for the next 50, 100 years and beyond. If you add up all of the dozen or so peace parks now underway or planned, it's the same surface area as the state of California, the state of New York, and the state of Texas combined. This is the biggest experiment in terrestrial conservation on the planet. And the motivator is primarily economic, but for me, that's fine. The conservation outcomes could be extraordinary. So I want to delve into a project that I've been working on for, gosh, more than 15 years. That amoeba-looking thing in southern Africa there, that is the biggest trans-frontier conservation area or peace park in Africa and probably in the world. It's called the Kavango Zambezi Trans-Frontier Conservation Area. Five countries have signed an international treaty to create it, Angola, Botswana, Namibia, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. You can see what it looks like superimposed across the northeastern United States. It's about 500,000 square kilometers plus. That's how big it is. It's vast. But it's not about, it's not a giant national park. I want to be clear. This is a complex multi-use program. So there's still agriculture. There's still people with their livestock. There's mining. There are other activities. But the idea of making the con connections wildlife friendly again is at the heart of a peace park. So since I was working in Botswana in the heart of Kaza, as it's called for short, in the early 1990s, I have watched what's happened. And as the colonial powers left, and independence came to these countries, all those subsidies that I described that were paying for the fences melted away. There's a huge veterinary infrastructure that was very expensive that was doing things like vaccinating uh, cattle against foot and mouth, keeping the fences maintained when elephants knocked them down, et cetera. That's all melted away, and now it's, the system's failing. The system is basically falling apart. If you open a local newspaper in any of the countries I named, almost every other week there's an outbreak of this virus, and that impacts the beef industry. So the attempts to control foot and mouth on this historical model with fences is failing. At the same time, conflict between the two sectors. Poor farmers are mad at wildlife. They blame wildlife for the disease. And the wildlife industry blames the livestock sector for the fences. It's, it's, it's a crisis. And for me, a crisis is a real opportunity. And so what we've been able to do, and again, I'm compressing. I have a whole hour. Can we stay an extra hour? I have an hour just on this. But I'm just going to do it in two more slides, I think. We've figured out. Uh, with many colleagues around the world that it really, you don't need to have a fence to separate your, your wildlife and your livestock. How you manage the beef to make it safe to eat actually works just fine. If you get a hamburger, hopefully you don't get E. coli or salmonella because of the way it's processed. There's a process system from the proverbial farm to fork that makes food safe to eat. But we've never managed foot and mouth using a process. We've always managed it internationally with fences. And so we've now proven that if you, for example, debone meat, Take out the lymph nodes, age a steak so that the pH drops below 6, which is what you do to make a high quality steak, that the foot and mouth disease virus can't survive that process. That was the easy part. That's meat science. I fell asleep during meat science at vet school. So that was the easy part. But the hard part was convincing the international bureaucracy 
to accept the meat science approach was legally equivalent, that's the word they use, equivalent to fences. And in, after 10 years of work with my colleagues in Southern Africa, lobbying what is essentially a branch of the WTO, all these decisions are made by the World Trade Organization ultimately, we were able to convince them in 2015 that we were right, and now for the first time in 70 years, farmers in Southern Africa can try this processing approach and they don't have to rely on fences. And now with some support from the Rockefeller Foundation and the Atkinson Center for a Sustainable Future at Cornell, I'm going back to Botswana in a month with one of my colleagues from Food, Sands, food Science, Randy Warobo, who works on the processing side, and we're gonna be working with farmers in partnership with the government to pilot this new approach so that the poorest farmers who live near wildlife finally get regular access to international markets and some of these fences can eventually be realigned and wildlife populations can rebound. That, I can tell you from experience, there aren't that many win-wins in this kind of work. And I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that in another five years, we're gonna have all this sorted out. It's very exciting. It really is a breakthrough in terms of poverty alleviation and sustainable livelihoods. It's good for farmers and it's good for wildlife. So that's what I call, that's an example when I lecture for the students of large landscape conservation. In my case, using veterinary science, to influence impact uh, across, as I said, a vast amount of conservation real estate. So I wanna now shift gears. I'm gonna give you the final entry point or doorway that we use to facilitate sustainable uh, decision making. And I wanna talk about the public health entry point. And to do that, I need to go back to sort of my original premise that today we are living in what others have described as the great collision. We are rapidly altering the planet's ecosystems and biogeochemical cycles, the climate system, in ways that are simply unprecedented. Don't worry about the details on these graphs, but even in the back, you can see they're all similar. They're all parabolas. They are examples of global consumption of paper, global consumption of fresh water, global loss of biodiversity, number of cars on the road on the planet. This goes back to that math problem I described. We are changing the planet in ways that are unprecedented, as I said. And one of the things that started to worry me in the mid-2000s, as I was working particularly in the developing world, is the, you know, the, the arguments that we were trying to make for conservation, they weren't resonating. And understandably so, if you're a developing country, you've gotta worry about feeding your people, you've gotta worry about basic primary health care. Conservation is often a luxury. So I started to ask myself, when is conservation potentially a public health good? And at the time, this was in the mid-2000s, there was a lot of work on a concept called ecosystem services. For those of you who aren't familiar with ecosystem services, ecosystem services is something that nature gives us that we haven't been very good at counting or paying for. It's sort of been a, a, a free service that, that the nature, natural world gives us. So for example, in New York City, the upper watershed catchment in the Catskills, the forests and management of the uplands provides clean water without the need for multi-billion dollar filtration systems in Manhattan. That forest cleansing of the water is an ecosystem service. In coastal areas, say in Southeast Asia, the fisheries that people rely on provide micronutrients that ensure the health of children under five. That's an ecosystem service. The air that we breathe that gets filtered by, by intact forests in the Amazon, or the climate system that gets shaped by intact forests, that's an ecosystem service. But nobody was looking at whether health was an ecosystem service. And I asked all the luminaries in the field, I said, why isn't anyone doing that? And basically said, we don't know, you should do it. So we got some funding from down the street from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, as well as from the Rockefeller Foundation. And I brought together uh, some of the best public health and environmental colleagues I could think of and basically locked them in a room multiple times. And we, we did an analysis and we wanted to know what, what is the state of science on the relationships between intact nature and public health? And we published this paper in the Proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences in 2013, and we looked at about 500 papers, basically everything we could find. And what, and I'm compressing again, what we found was that as of 2013, there were literally only a handful of studies that really documented an important change in an ecosystem of some type and a, an epidemiologically important change in a public health outcome. In other words, the science wasn't there. There was a lot of anecdotal information, particularly from the NGO community, which is where I was working. Lots of stories about, well, save the forest because it'll make you healthy. That was aspirational thinking, but it wasn't hard science. So we realized we had to do prospective research. If we, if we thought there was a, a valid hypothesis here, we actually had to test it. When is intact nature also a public health good? Because that could help us make better arguments for both sectors. So in this analysis that I was just describing, one of the things that emerged from it was in fact that we are undergoing what we termed the ecological transition. 
And I just got to run you through this. This is not complicated, but I think it, it makes some important points. What this graph shows is on the vertical axis going up is people's health getting better. Moving up on that axis, you're getting healthier. And going out on the horizontal axis is the ongoing degradation of the, the planet's various ecosystems over time. And you can see three arrows. Those top two arrows represent the wealthy and middle classes of the planet. And you can see that over time, even though we're destroying many of the world's ecosystems and changing the climate, the wealthy and middle class are getting healthier. The global statistics in public health tell us that. We are living longer at that macro scale. Fewer mortalities in children under five. That's a little bit paradoxical. Well, why it's possible is that the wealthy and middle class of the world, all of us here, we are currently able to re replace nature services with markets and infrastructure. We have hospitals. You can go to CVS or Rite Aid and get medicines. But the poorest of the poor are already being impacted by these ecological changes. They live closest to wild nature and depend on wild nature for food, shelter, fiber, etc. So there's a social equity issue now. But if you think about this, if, if you look at this to its logical extension, you take this further out in time, I'm willing to, to bet that those top two arrows will dip down if we continue on the current trajectory. And we, we believe that we cannot maintain public health gains on a foundation of sand, that we have to be more respectful of the planetary systems that are supporting us. So what that tells me is that we also have an intergenerational equity issue to deal with. In other words, we are in many ways borrowing the future from our children and grandchildren. We have to change course in order to prevent that intergenerational inequity from becoming reality. And that's what the ecological transition is all about. This work um, really got a lot of attention and we were able to create a consortium that is, uh, I started it with partners at Harvard, it's called the Planetary Health Alliance. And it now is comprised of more than 70 universities, NGOs, and government agencies focused on developing a rigorous uh, policy-focused transdisciplinary field trying to understand and quantify the human health impacts of environmental change because if we can't measure them, we can't manage them and we can't use them in the policy arena. So the basic question that we've been asking all along is whether, when, and how public health is a benefit provided by relatively unmodified systems. And I want to be, we have to be very careful here. I want to be intellectually honest. I am not standing here telling you that intact nature always equals good health. We drain swamps to get rid of malaria. Totally get that. We cut down trees to plant crops to feed people nutritious foods. I accept that. But the question is, when is conservation uh, a net net conservation and public health good? In order to answer that question, we had to generate a framework that made this, this information manageable because this is really complex. Basically, you can divide any, any, put any health issue into one of these four buckets. Communicable or infectious disease, non-communicable diseases like cancers, diseases related to nutrition, and mental health, psychological and social health. Those are the four buckets of health we decided to look at. And then we also looked at all the world's different types of ecosystems, savannas, coral reefs, forests, etc. And we did a series of prospective research studies to try and answer the questions that I've been describing to you. And I'm, I'm only going to run through two. This is a, a very broad research portfolio. Um, but I'm just going to give you two examples because I think they're good ones. This first one was led by a colleague of mine, Chris Golden, who's now at Harvard. And he spent a lot of his time in rural Madagascar. And his project was called Evaluating the Linkages Between Nutrition and Access to Wildlife. So for those of you who don't know, malnutrition is among the biggest contributors to the burden of uh, disease. About a third of the total burden of disease is due to uh, undernutrition. At least 3 billion people today suffer from micronutrient deficiencies, and at least a billion people are undernourished. And what Chris noticed uh, was that the villages in rural Madagascar who had hunted out all of their wildlife or let outsiders come in and hunt all their wildlife, their kids didn't look well. And he started to look at this as, as a public health guy, which is he's a half public health guy and he's half ecologist. He's an interesting mix. And so he did a study on the kids of the villages had lost their wildlife and the villages that still had access to wildlife to feed their families. And what he found was that the kids who no longer had access to wildlife had a 30% chance, higher chance of being anemic. And if you know anything about childhood anemia, you know it has lifelong debilitating consequences. If you're anemic, you're going to have a lower IQ. You're not going to be able to pay attention in school. You're probably not going to be able to do physical labor for very long. You're probably not going to be able to hold down a job. This childhood anemia had generational consequences. And the women heads of household of these villages got it. This, this research got so much attention in Madagascar, uh, it, it was really, really interesting that the, the Minister of Public Health in Madagascar 
started to look at this and partnered with the Minister of the Environment to look at wildlife conservation as a public health intervention. Now, interestingly, while the public health community got really excited about this, the conservation community was a little bit lukewarm about the whole thing because what it really spoke to was the fact that wildlife is, serves as a human larder. And we're kidding ourselves if we don't recognize whether we're talking about fish or mammals. Many places around the world, people absolutely depend on wildlife to feed themselves for, for both protein and micronutrients. And so I, over time, I find that my colleagues in conservation have warmed up to this. But if we don't measure the value of wildlife by also looking at what it means for kids' nutrition, we're losing a whole typology of value that could be a game changer in terms of sustainable management. This, this research has convinced the government of Madagascar that wildlife conservation is in their public health interest. That is unprecedented, and that gives us leverage that we never would have had. These are some of the headlines, and I know you can't read them in the back, that came out of this research. Things like, researchers find that wildlife loss hurts kids. Lack of bushmeat from wildlife could increase child's risks of anemia. Benefits of wildlife consumption to child nutrition in a biodiversity hotspot demonstrated. This was a really neat mix of public health and environmental conservation in an unprecedented way that has had huge traction in real world decision making in this country. I want to give you quickly uh, a second example, and this is at a very different scale. This was another one of these complex projects that we decided would help us look at these relationships between nature and health. And this is a project uh, led by colleagues from Harvard and Columbia University. It's called Human Health Impacts of Fire-Based Land Management in Equatorial Asia. Some of this project grew out of my own frustrations when I was at the World Wildlife Fund, as, as was mentioned in the early 2000s. My job was to save wild tigers, orangutans, elephants, and rhinos in Southeast Asia. And it wasn't easy. As a matter of fact, this map shows between 1985 and 2009, the red is deforestation. And I can tell you, if I had the 2017 map, it's not any better. So we were fighting you know, a, you know, a, a major, major macroeconomic challenge with a conservationist toolbox, and it wasn't working. What was really going on was there was a global market change. There are two industries driving this. One is the global paper and pulp industry, and then the second is the palm oil industry. So the, the paper and pulp folks would come in, take down the forest, turn it into things like tissue paper and paper that's even in your own photocopy machine, and then they would burn the land, and we're going to come back to that, and the palm oil industry would come in and plant palm oil. Palm oil is among the most important traded globally you know, edible oils. It's in many products that all of us uh, see at the supermarket. It's in candy bars. It's in cosmetics. It's, it's, it's a very widely used oil. With that burning that was done to clear land, there was a massive environmental change, and air quality across the entire region shifts every season. It's burning season, and we described this region across Southeast Asia as a health shed. You know what a watershed is. We started to think about this as a health shed, so that not only are Indonesians inhaling these 2.5 and smaller particulates from this burning, but people in Malaysia and Singapore are inhaling it too, and this was known. We didn't discover this. Every season, these, these particles float across, and there's significant impacts in terms of cardiopulmonary disease to the tune of billions, with a B, billions of dollars of public health costs, primarily in the very young and in the very old, people with asthma, people with cardiopulmonary compromise. So there's these two issues going on. There's a, an industrial activity in a place like Sumatra, and then there's this downwind public health impact. But no one was able to connect the dots in, again, a scientifically robust way that could hold the, the actors here accountable, and that's key, because for the palm oil industry and the paper and pulp industry, you economists know that this public health impact was an externality. An externality in economics means it's something, you, it's not on your books. You're not paying for it. You're making money hand over fist selling palm oil, but someone else is paying those real public health costs. So I'm not an atmospheric modeler, but my colleagues at Harvard and Columbia have explained all this to me. Basically, their science is so sophisticated, and these are the same folks who developed this, the models that, that NASA uses, that they were able to look at different times of year and figure out which specific particles were coming from which parts of Sumatra, at, and they could actually basically pinpoint which company's concessions were causing what kind of public health burdens. That was a first. And the other first was the modeling was able to quantify what was really going on in terms of mortality. And this was in 2015, this was published. This, this like, like the Madagascar bushmeat study, this got huge press in Southeast Asia as well as around the world. This team found that conservatively 100,000 people died in Southeast Asia. Not, I'm not counting the people who just got sick. At least 100,000 deaths just in that one burning season. 
This got ASEAN's attention, ASEAN being the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. And very interestingly, we were able to get the Office of the President of Indonesia's office to come to our first annual meeting of the Planetary Health Alliance, which we just held, to talk about this issue. This was something that could no longer not be dealt with. And interestingly, while we were doing this work, the government of Singapore was wringing their hands. They developed the first transboundary haze pollution law. But they were struggling with, again, holding companies accountable. With the science that we now have, they could actually take companies to court and, and show them that their particulates that they were generating were causing this specific amount of morbidity and mortality and, and calculate it in disability-adjusted life years and dollars. As a side note, probably not surprisingly to those of you who know the region, many of the companies who were doing the burning in Sumatra were actually Singaporean companies. So that was another interesting twist. So to take it all back home, you know, we were able to use this, this satellite monitoring and mathematical modeling to finally create a chain of accountability between the environmental degradation and a significant public health outcome. Uh, and we were able to help policymakers actually make informed decisions that they could justify. And it all fed back on, on my tigers and my rhinos. If we're going to save what's left of lowland Sumatra or Kalimantan for that matter, it's going to be because of this kind of thing. It's not going to be because of the other moral and ethical arguments we've made to save biodiversity. So those two examples just outline what we call the science policy approach, where we work with decision makers first and foremost before we even design our research to find out what are the information gaps that they, they have? What information do they need to, to deal with these very complex systems and decisions? And we work on developing the science to fill those policy gaps and to identify the tools that will help them in the real world. We work with a, a lot of disciplines, and that's one of the great things for me about being at Cornell is I have access to all these experts across the entire campus, and everybody wants to work together because I think the term is that we are in Ithaca centrally isolated. So there is a real incentive for everyone to collaborate. And now we're documenting these case studies, and we can't extrapolate cookie cutter all of these examples to other parts of the world, but there are enough lessons learned that we can learn from them and use these same types of approaches to solve other environment public health problems. As I mentioned earlier, the public health community has been pretty quick to, to take this, this concept on, this, this, what we are now calling planetary health. But the conservation community, where I come from, they were a little bit skeptical. And I had to do things like write editorials in our main journal, Conservation Biology, shaking my colleagues up and say, look, human health is a judicious conservation opportunity. We need to recognize that the greatest public health threats coming in the years ahead will likely relate to the transformation of the natural systems that the conservation community is worried about. So we as conservationists have to get more savvy. We have to learn how to speak to our colleagues in public health. We have to learn their language. And the public health community has to be able to speak to the conservation community and to economists and to political scientists. We've got to break down these silos. We've, a lot of this work is about characterizing the so-called planetary boundaries. Planetary boundaries basically means how far can we push the global phosphorus cycle or the climate system before it's too late. We need to understand that because we are approaching some of those boundaries. And the other thing I'll say, I was a little bit nervous about becoming an academic because I spent most of my career in the nonprofit sector. Um, but I will say I've been very comfortable. The research we're designing, I guess it's academic research, but it's all policy driven and it's all about impact. And compared to the time even when I was a student in the, in the late 1980s at Cornell, there is such an emphasis on real world impact. Things like the Atkinson Center that are really trying to get academics to apply their skills to solve real world problems. It's thrilling. It's a thrilling time to be on campus. And I tell the students, it's all about moving from science to policy to action. That's why we're here. All of this public health work that I just described to you was actually captured by a really neat partnership between the Rockefeller Foundation and the medical journal, The Lancet. The Lancet is the world's premier medical journal, and they created what they call a commission. There were 15 of us brought together for a year to basically write a white paper that sort of captures a lot of what I've been telling you here today. And that white paper was called Safeguarding Human Health in the Anthropocene uh, Era. Anthropocene being the age of humanity, meaning that we are the drivers of what's happening on Earth. And unlike many reports that just end up on a shelf, this one is actually getting used. It's getting used by the UN system, the WHO, the United Nations Development Program. So I want to just take the last few slides to, to, to better define planetary health so that you leave here knowing what it is. And I'm going to give you two definitions. The first definition is a quotation from the Lancet Rockefeller Report. I'm just going to read it to you. Planetary health is the achievement of the highest attainable standard of health, well-being, and equity worldwide through judicious attention 
to the human systems, political, economic, and social, that shape the future of humanity and the Earth's natural systems that define the safe environmental limits within which humanity can flourish. Put simply, planetary health is the health of human civilization and the state of the natural systems on which it depends. Now that's, that's a high level definition and what I found as I started to work with individual countries and individual decision makers, they needed what I described as an operational definition. So I, this is my operational definition where planetary health is a field focused specifically on improving our understanding and our ability to measure the public health impacts of anthropogenic or human caused environmental change so as to inform decision making in the land use planning, ocean use planning, environmental conservation, and public health policy realms. This, this concept of planetary health is, as I said, it's really being taken up and I, I was really honored to, I was the only veterinarian on the commission. It was mostly public health people, a few, a few environmental colleagues, but it was a really nice mix of disciplines focusing on you know, th this really uh, interesting point in human history that we're at. And as I said, the UN system in particular has really uh, taken this idea on. And this, this is a chart showing the UN Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs. These are going to be discussed in New York in the upcoming week at the General Assembly. These are about, these are the goals that all the UN member countries, basically the entire world, have agreed upon as their, as their guideposts for the, for the next several years. They're about ensuring provision of nutritious foods for the world's population, the availability, ensuring the availability of clean water, and so on. And they've adopted this planetary health thinking, this complex systems approach, as almost the thread that ties this fabric of the Sustainable Development Goals together. So we're getting asked all the time to help think through these challenges in this transdisciplinary way, uh, which it's, it's part happenstance that we, we started to work on planetary health at the same time that the UN was really recognizing that they needed a new way of doing business. So that's been very exciting. So to wrap up, students, particularly veterinary students, but undergraduates as well, have often have often heard of some of the fields that I've got on this slide. There was a field called conservation medicine. Uh, I was involved in launching a concept called One Health, which some of you may have heard of. It's all about, in a generic sense, the relationships, as I said early on, between animal health uh, and the environment and human health. Now we have eco health, and today I talk to you about planetary health. You know, I tell students these are all circles that overlap on a Venn diagram. I don't really care what the students call it. The bottom line, the message is for, for the next graduating classes at Cornell is they need to recognize that these complex or so-called wicked problems that humanity faces are unlikely to be solved by any one discipline in isolation. I want the students coming out of Cornell to know that if they're veterinarians, they're gonna need to work with public health colleagues and economists and anthropologists and political scientists because these, these systems are too complicated. And that's really become, I think, uh, well, well understood at Cornell where students work as teams in their training and they take that team thinking out into the real world. So if they leave recognizing that each of them, whatever they trained in, has some of the tools that are important for the toolbox, but probably not all of them, they'll be more successful. And hopefully, when they're giving this lecture in several decades, some of the statistics I gave you will continue to have been uh, on the upswing. So I think, I think that's where I'm gonna end, and I just would say that we should pay attention when nature is sending us signals, because it's often in our own best interest. Thank you. That's flamingos making a flamingo. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to tell you how they did it. I, I think it's Photoshop. <laughs> Do we have questions? Yeah, uh, Professor. Yes, uh, thank you very much for your uh, your your lecture here. It's very informative. I was wondering, uh, in the Cornell setting, uh, the different disciplines that you have working together here. Uh, do you have uh, colleagues from the business school involved in this as well? Because it, part of the driver in this, in some of the behaviors, is driven through uh, business and uh, you know the, the private sector. And I was wondering uh, whether or not the business school has been pulled into looking at these sustainability problems. At, definitively, yes. For example, I work with a colleague named John Tobin, who is very interested in the, the, the business cases for some of these things. You know, these, it, I, when I talk to students, I remember when I was a vet student in the 80s, and I came to vet school thinking conservation was about animals. And over the course of my career, it's become clear, it's really, it's about economics and human behavior. And so if you don't involve the private sector, 
and in the case of campus, the business school, you can't do any of this. The beef work that I'm doing, I've got to make a business case for that. The planetary health work is all grounded in measurable quantitative science because otherwise you won't prevail. So one of the ways that that happens at Cornell, for me anyway, uh, is through things like the Atkinson Center, which is really a convener of disciplines across campus. We had a luncheon on planetary health, and that's when I first met colleagues from the business school, and we started to talk about some of our common interests. And so, absolutely. I'm going to do one more question, because we want to make sure that everybody, you don't have to walk up the hill to get to your next class, but we do want to make sure you have time for snacks and a break and the restroom before we kick up. And we've got friends joining us on the live stream, so we want to make sure we stay on time. So we're going to give one last question to Bob. Great. So first of all, I really enjoyed the talk. And I enjoy, I, I appreciate the interdisciplinary uh, methods that you're using and the methods overall for doing scientific testing rather than anecdotal evidence. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. But my question is, especially speaking about business, why is there not a business uh, with regard to the rhinoceros horns, a business for raising rhinoceri, or if not raising them, at least clipping the horns and then selling them, which seems like that would eliminate poaching and could potentially be pretty profitable? We're going to need a few hours on that one. Okay. But it's, it is a great question, because we get that question about tiger bone, we get it about elephant ivory, and we get it about rhino horn. And the short answer is, there is no way to manage the leakage issue. In other words, if you have a legal trade of, of rhino horn, there is still no mechanism to keep illegal horn from getting into that market. The South Africans very much want a legal rhino horn trade because they are protecting rhinos and they want to benefit from it. It is one of the thorniest issues in conservation and it fundamentally relates to the challenges of regulating a global market for that product. But we can, I'm going to be here all, the whole day and I'm, I'd love to talk to you more about that. That's just a really important question and one that tears the conservation community apart, to be honest. 